We live in a big, weird universe, likely crowded with all kinds of intelligent beings on different levels of evolution. And humanity is about to cross the horizon of its planet forever and to explore the universe. What we will discover there will most likely revolutionize our understanding of the cosmos. And there are very few people who already think about what may lie ahead. And one of them is my guest today. Welcome to the show, Sean Aspiron Hagens. Uh, thanks, Robert. Great to be here. Excited to see where our conversation takes us today. I'm also excited that you're here because you are a PhD uh, in the you, you made your PhD in the humanities. You study psych psychology and um, philosophy and biology. Is that correct? Yeah, with a focus on the philosophy of science, and I applied that in the context of environmental thinking and ecological science. Um, but since then, I've I've expanded um, in a lot of additional directions. Okay, I see. So um, you being a scientist, um, you worked at the JFK University. Um, what made you think, what made you start to thinking about such an issue? Well, I've always been interested in what's the nature of reality. And so science is a great place um, to focus on for understanding what's real Though I've always had, you know, more of a philosophical kind of bent. So I've been interested in like, what's the philosophy behind science? Like, you know, what, what are the different worldviews and orientations that inform scientific, you know, research and investigation? And, and so that's led me into, you know, studying consciousness. And, and in the study of consciousness, looking at, you know, how people approach the environment was a major focus for many years. But that's expanded over the last few years into UFOs and the paranormal, um, because I find that such a taboo topic. And there's a lot of ways to investigate it scientifically, but there's a taboo around it so that in many respects, people don't really know what that might look like or how might we approach such a topic more scientifically um, or even philosophically. So I'm I'm interested in contributing to up-leveling our science so that it can be adequate for the task at hand with exploring such paranormal and anomalous realities. And you mentioned before in previous interviews that you have uh, had your own anomalous encounters of that strange reality. Would you go into that a little? Yeah. So, you know, I've been you know, spiritual practitioner in a number of traditions, you know, for the last 20 years. And, you know, I've been a longtime meditator and, you know, I've tried a lot of different practices and techniques, you know, some of which have been more esoteric in nature, some more kind of mainstream Buddhism, so to speak. And over the last few years, you know, I increasingly was having experiences of what I consider multidimensionality having precognitive experiences, different types of paranormal experiences, um, meditative experiences that were putting me in touch with additional types of intelligences and different types of subtle beings, you know, that occur in visionary states or in other types of uh, modes of consciousness. And this just seemed to be occurring more and more in my life. And, you know, being interested in consciousness and human development and philosophy of science, I just became more interested in, you know, what's going on? Like, what is the nature of our universe such that it appears to be multidimensional and it appears to be inhabited by a vast multitude of different types of intelligences? And this is something that human beings have been reporting, you know, from the get go. Um, so I began to kind of aim my philosophical and scientific thinking at this topic to try and better understand, you know, what all of this might say to us about the nature of reality. Hmm. So when you say there is a multidimensional touch to all of this, um, is there anything on earth that makes you believe that? I mean, if you look at the, we, you know, we've been, um, we've been researching nuts and bolts UFO cases for, for decades. Um, yeah. It's always about landing traces, physiological interaction with the environment, um, all of that radar traces, what more could there possibly be? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I feel there's a lot of good physical evidence. There's a lot of good scientific evidence on the nuts and bolts side of the UFO, you know, investigation. 
And, you know, along with folks like John Keel and Jacques Vallée, I find the high strangeness aspect of many of these encounters to be even more fascinating because they challenge our ideas of subject and object, of self and other, of time and space. And it just feels to me, based on, you know, the vast literature I've read and my own experiences and, and the people I've talked to, both experiencers and investigators, that to really understand the UFO phenomena in all of its multiple facets, you really have to include consciousness and you have to include energy and light and intelligence. And, and you, you can't really get at the mystery of the UFO phenomena with strictly nuts and bolts scientific approach, though I feel that approach is really essential on many levels, but it just doesn't get to the, the core mystery that I'm, I'm interested in trying to have a deeper relationship with. Mm. So what is the core mystery that you're interested in? I, for me, it's, it's just what's the nature of reality and what does the UFO and paranormal phenomena show us about that? And because of my own experiences and talking with others, you know, I'm constantly brought to the, the possibility that we live in a multidimensional universe, that there's other worlds, other timelines, there's other realities, there's, you know, beings operating in the invisible light spectrum, there's beings and craft who have the ability to manifest into our reality and then manifest out of it, um, that we don't really understand this and how it works, though, you know, some people I think have some good ideas and research around it, but it's, it really challenges so many of our assumptions. And I think this is why there's such a big taboo around this topic is because it undercuts the, you know, kind of core Western paradigm of, of what is reality and, and why we're here. Materialism, so me, materialistic yeah, point. Yeah. Materialism, reductionism. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Mm. Okay. And so you founded Exo Studies, the Exo Studies Institute, which deals with the integration uh, of all kinds of other aspects to science. What, what, is, what is there to be integrated in your view in order to understand it? Yeah. So, you know, I was really inspired to found the Institute when I was finishing reading the book Hunt for the Skinwalker and which deals with the scientific effort over a decade to study the paranormal and, and ufological experiences that were happening on this ranch in Utah. And what struck me about that book was they had all kinds of money, the best research, you know, tons of PhDs, you know, arguably some of the best scientists on the planet who were all trying to capture data related to UFO encounters and the paranormal. And essentially after a decade, they came up empty. Like they had a lot of experiences. There was a lot of anomalous activities, but there was nothing that was repeatable. There was, you know, the data that they got out of that wasn't really fitting into the categories of scientific data as we understand it. And so this really intrigued me because I felt like there's a real phenomenon here. And yet our current approach to it via science is inadequate. And so we need to develop, um, evolve our scientific approach to be able to meet the phenomena, to be able to explore it and investigate it and understand it. And so that combined with my own experiences led me to founding the Institute and, and doing it with a focus on integration, which has just been my professional background and training. And And so not only do I focus on the UFO and what I call the space studies literature, which is you know, the core literature that most people would associate with the study of UFOs and with you know, exoplanets and space exploration. But in addition to that body of work, I also draw on more traditional academic and scientific literature and you know, including you know, new approaches to feminism and you know, political science, um, psychology, media studies, you know, a whole slew of, you know, kind of disciplines that you would associate with a college campus. But in addition to that body of literature, I also draw on the esoteric and paranormal literature, right? And, you know, look at magic studies and look at, you know, different approaches to, you know, poltergeists or ghosts or near-death experiences, out-of-body experiences, because I feel we really, to, to study UFOs in an integrative way, we need to go beyond the bounds of the literature that historically has been associated with that field. 
draw on the best knowledge we have from the academic disciplines, as well as the long history of paranormal and esoteric literature, because this phenomenon is so mysterious, so complex, so out of this world, if you will, that we really need to basically approach it from multiple angles, multiple modes of investigation um, in order, I believe, to really start to have an appreciation for the multifaceted nature of it. So Exo Studies is really an effort to bring what I call a meta-disciplinary approach, which essentially means drawing on over 100, 150 different disciplines, and then pointing all of that at the UFO mystery to see how might we better understand UFOs and associated phenomenon by drawing on many disciplines that historically have not been included in the knowledge quest as to what's going on. That sounds like a big chunk of work. What makes you so optimistic that you will be able to achieve all this during your own lifetime? Um, well, it's very likely I won't in my own lifetime, though I think I can you know, contribute to setting us on a path of, of doing this. And for me, one strategy is to identify meta principles that serve as guidelines for how we might approach this. Um, and so, you know, my background is in integrative thinking and working with meta models and integrative meta theory. You know, so I've studied the work of Ken Wilber, the, the work of Edgar Moran, um, the work of Roy Bashkar, you know, as well as others. But those three figures in particular have developed big maps to try and explain all or most of reality. So my philosophical and theoretical training is in developing meta approaches to topics. When I did my PhD, I focused on environmental studies and I identified 200 different schools of ecological thinking and environmental thinking and, and identified core insights from those 200 schools that we could pull together to help us address the environmental issues we're facing. So it's just in my bones to try and take a big picture and figure out how might we approach a complex topic, drawing on dozens and dozens of disciplines. And it's a group effort. You know, there are more and more people joining me at the Institute who are inspired by this meta-disciplinary approach, who want to have a scientific approach to UFOs, but also who are interested in the consciousness and the paranormal aspects and don't see that as, you know, you know a contradiction. Um, so I think little by little we'll make progress. And, you know, when you look at what's happening in ufology right now with the New York Times and the articles there publishing and the shift in the discourse, it feels like a real exciting time to, to be contributing to the study and exploration of UFOs. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, talking about the conclusions of your meta analysis, what, what uh, are there any conclusions you are already able to draw? Like, about the most fundamental questions, where do they come from? So yeah, so there are kind of a number of initial metadisciplinary, you know, kind of conclusions or, you know, insights that I've arrived at. One is around this question you just asked, like, who are they, where are they from? And I started to do an analysis of the different theories of UFOs and, and their occupants. And often you will come across people acknowledging two or three different theories. There's the extraterrestrial hypothesis that suggests that these are biological entities from you know, star systems far, far away. You have the extra dimensional hypothesis associated with people like John Keel and Jacques Vallée, who claim that they're not necessarily extraterrestrial, but they're extra dimensional and that in some cases they might actually be from here but they're just living in or occupying another dimension that somehow overlaps with our own physical world. There's other people who take a more Jungian approach, and this is called the psychosocial hypothesis that essentially views um, UFOs and the entities as some kind of archetypal energies or manifestations that are responding to our scientific reductionism. So I went through and in my recent article, Our Wild Cosmos, I documented 10 different hypotheses as to who are these beings and where are they coming from? So there's a lot of different views about this. And I think it's helpful when you actually see the list and all the different theories that have been advanced as to, you know, who are they and where are they from? Because my sense of it is that each of these 10 hypotheses 
has a piece of the truth and that some sightings are better explained with one hypothesis and other encounters or sightings are better explained with a different hypothesis. And in some cases, some encounters might require you to use several different hypotheses to understand different aspects of the phenomena. Because it's not just that we live in a multidimensional reality. My sense and experience is that UFOs in themselves and, and the beings connected to them often are multidimensional in nature as well. And so there's often not a singular theory or hypothesis that best explains it. You have to really kind of hold the doors open and realize that there might be multiple, even contradictory explanations that um, account for or give us insight to this. So it's a very paradoxical orientation because, you know, we, you, I find that the UFO phenomena just challenges our sense of linear time, of space, our sense of self and other, of inside and outside. So a lot of exo studies is about holding the possibility of paradoxical explanations. And so this has led me to develop what I call the mutual enactment hypothesis, which essentially is trying to honor the truth or insight of all 10 of these different approaches. And that there's some way in which our own consciousness is participating with the manifestation of the phenomenon, um, be they craft or beings. And it doesn't mean that those entities don't exist in some sense independent of our own awareness, but it is to say that there is a participatory dynamic where we are in some sense co-enacting, co-creating the experiences and they as beings and craft are likewise participating, co-creating us. And so that there's a very dynamic way in which these encounters are occurring. So that's one kind of meta point is by analyzing all the different theories of UFOs and trying to understand how might all of them be contributing to some aspect of our understanding of the phenomena. The other main area that I've been looking into is around entities and, you know, what I call non-human intelligences, because you find these reports, you know, throughout the literature, the abduction literature, the contactee literature, the experiencer literature. But in addition to that, you find it in the fairy lore, you find it in the poltergeist literature, you find it in the cryptozoological literature. People are encountering and interacting with all kinds of beings. So with I fairies, did a minute, with jinn, with aliens, with spirits, with angels, celestials, galactics, elementals, all kinds exactly. of exactly, yeah, the full range. And in some cases, you know, it seems that people are encountering, you know, extraterrestrials, and they're interpreting them as fairy beings. In other cases, people are having encounters with nature spirits and the subtle realm and in, in, in natural environments, and you know, thinking those are aliens. So th there appears to be a, a wide range of different types of beings that humans can and, and often do encounter. And we don't have a good cartography. We don't have a good typology of the types of beings and, and how can there be so many different types. Um, and so I started going deep into the experience or literature to try and get a better sense of what are people encountering in the context of UFO encounters. And I identify 12 major sources. These are, you know, authors who have, you know, in many cases spent their life studying um, these types of events. And I, I went through their material to see what are the different kinds of aliens or ETs that they report people encountering. And I created a chart in my article that details 33 different types of beings um, and which authors in the 12 sources have, you know, identified each of those beings as occurring in their research. And, and so this starts to give us a sense of the variety of, you know, extraterrestrial slash extra dimensional beings. And it's interesting because the top five are what often are considered the classic extraterrestrials. You have human looking ETs, you have the grays, short and tall you have the insectoid types and you have the reptilian types. And these five beings don't only show up in the UFO literature, they show up in the shamanic literature, they show up in the out of body experience literature, they show up in the ayahuasca and um, DMT literature, you know, the psychedelic literature. So these five beings along with other types seem to show up in a wide range of contact modalities. So for me, this is a very fascinating finding because it suggests that these beings exist in some independent way 
and that people encounter them under a wide range of circumstances and situations, um, all of which generally involve an altered state of consciousness in one sense or another. But it does seem to point to the idea that in these altered states of consciousness, people are entering into other worlds, other dimensions, and they keep encountering the same set of characters, the same types of um, non-human intelligences. You would expect that if this was all fantasy and imagination, that there would just be a vast variety of types of beings encountered. That's not so much what we find. There seem to be certain um, types that show up over and over again, regardless of the contact modality. Regardless of whether it's in the, in a dream or in, in reality or ayahuasca uh, ceremonies exactly. or uh, that's interesting. Yeah. And all of these beings also reported as being physical. So there are enough encounters that report a, a very physical dimension to the encounter. So this is important too, because these beings are not just showing up in a dreamlike or a, you know an altered state and, and kind of a consciousness sense. They also seem under certain circumstances to have a, a physicality, even a biological dimension to them. But they it doesn't seem that we can reduce their entire um, you know, expression to just that biological um, component or just an energetic component. They seem to be able to move back and forth across those types of, you know, energetic and physical expressions. Mm. Okay. So uh, it seems there, there is a big variety of, of beings approaching Earth. And, um, and so it's difficult to say it's them, they, you know, right. where do they come from? But It, right. But so that makes it really complex if you think about uh, the earth being just a, uh, like a needle in the haystack, you know, like this small little dot in the universe, uh, which expands in all kind in all directions eternally. And uh, there may be an infinite number of ex of non-human intelligences, as you call them, approaching earth and doing whatever they are doing here. <laughs> so how do you approach questions like what do they want? Yeah, and it's an important question that is at the forefront of people's mind because when you're dealing with the alien other, it's very vulnerable, it's very scary, it's very overwhelming to even consider that there are other non-human intelligences out there, let alone when you start to document and explain the likely wide variety of them. Like that in itself is overwhelming. But yeah, there's, you know, drawing on the exopolitical work of Michael Solis, you know, some of his earlier work, He presents, you know, four different kinds of motivations, right? Like the observers, the intruders, the manipulators, the watchers. I find that set of distinctions a useful starting point to highlighting that, you know, there are at least these four major different types of moral orientations, if you will, that we find across these types of beings. But it's important to realize that even with, you know, with each of the different types of beings, whether you're talking about the greys or the reptilians, you find all four different types of, of worldviews or orientations within each type of being. So it's not that greys are all the manipulators dealing with D, you know, um, DNA and, you know, and that the human looking beings are always the benevolent, you know, loving Palladians, right? It seems to be much more complex than that that within each kind of, you know, species or race of beings, you, just like here on Earth, you know, you have, you know, people with all kinds of different political views across the political spectrum. So similarly, you have a wide range of motivations and spiritual realization or moral obligation within, you know, any race or species of, of extraterrestrial, extra-dimensional beings. So it makes it just even more complex. But in our mainstream society, like we want to reduce it all to grays and make those grays bad. So I think part of the effort that I have an impulse towards is trying to expand that a little bit, saying, hey, you know, there's a lot more types of beings than just the grays. And there's a lot more types of orientations than just, you know, abductee, you know, types of agendas and DNA manipulation like You know, we, like humans, there's a vast variety of different, you know, viewpoints that are out there, mm. but it obviously makes it even more difficult to study and, and explain because it's just so overwhelming to start to consider any of that. Yeah. So you have, um, you have a list of four scenarios there. They may be the intruders, the manipulators, the helpers, and the observers. Yeah. You know, the intruders, they want our natural resources. They want our biodiversity 
or the manipulators, they want our DNA, they want to produce fear as a source of energetic food. That's, I think that's the uh, David Icke uh, hypothesis, isn't it? Um, it is. It also shows up just as an interesting you know, point of connection in Paul Eno's work around ghosts and poltergeists. He's come to view a lot of poltergeists as being driven by negative entities who are generating the poltergeist phenomena as a way of creating fear in the people living in the house so that those negative entities can then draw on the, the energy that's produced in that process. Um, so you, this is what becomes interesting when you take an exostudies view and you start to see patterns like that across very different types of literature, right? Because it can be very easy to dismiss David Icke and some of his crazy outlandish ideas but when you start to come across similar points that are being made by someone who's not familiar with Ike's work at all, but they're discovering some similar dynamics or insights in a totally different context, i.e. hauntings in houses, and you start to see similar patterns, to me, that starts to point to the deeper shared reality underlying many of these types of phenomena. Hmm. So... Um there is a fifth scenario missing in your list, in, in my opinion, um, yeah, which may be, which may be, uh, I mean, Nick Bostrom's simulation theory. Uh, we may be nothing but mere apps running, apps right. in a biological form running in an operating system called three-dimensional reality. Uh, so yeah. they may be the antivirus program or they may be even our creators. Uh, so yeah. the, the creator <laughs> scenario, what do you think of the simulation theory that this is all actually, um, let's say, um, an experiment in an alien lab? Yeah, I think we have to take the simulation hypothesis very seriously. I think there's a lot of good reasons to consider that some version of that is the case. I think that, you know, when you look at the religious traditions, they also you know, especially the contemplative esoteric versions, they often point to a similar insight, right? That the, the world is illusion, it's Maya, that, you know, we're, um, you know, we need to wake up, right? You know, so, um, though for me, you know, even to the extent that the simulation hypothesis might be real, to me, I often ask myself kind of, so what? You know, like, if that is the case, I'm enjoying this simulation, right? Like, I have at least an illusion of free will. And, and to the extent that might be illusory, like I still have the experience of loving my daughter. I still have the experience of feeling frustration over certain things happening in my life and joy over other things. So I almost feel like, okay, let it be a simulation. It doesn't change my passions, my process of growth and development. And even if ultimately that in some sense is illusory, the experience of it is very visceral and vivid. And so, I don't know, it's just kind of like, sure, why not? But and it doesn't brings up, And that brings yeah. up the question, is it the purpose of our three-dimensional existence to try to understand the bigger nature of your reality? Yeah, yeah. And this is why I find, you know, the study of, of UFOs and the paranormal as a very powerful way, in a sense of looking for the glitch in the matrix. Right. Because, you know, these phenomena, they, they violate our sense of consensus reality. And so there might be clues in that as to how we might wake up or get out of the simulation. Right. Similar to kind of Neo and his journey in the Matrix. Right. So so that's part of my fascination with all of this is I suspect it gives us some breadcrumb clues as to, you know, how might we um, transcend the, the simulation in some important way. Okay, so trying to provide the, the red pill or was it the blue pill? I can't remember. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so uh, you're offering an, a course, right, in Exo Studies. Can you tell us about, about that? Yeah, so, you know, this last year I did a, a six-month course and then more recently I did a, a six-week course. Um, and, you know, the focus really is, you know, this next course is a year long because I just found there were too many juicy topics, too many weird areas that I wanted to explore. So I identified all the topics that I felt were really necessary to have a meta view of reality. And it turned out that there were 42 of them. And so to have a, a 42 week program, you basically need a year, right? With 52 weeks. So it's a year long program. And we really cover everything. You can look at the list of topics on the website, exostudies.org. 
And it, the idea is really to have it be a community of practice where we really together are exploring the nature of reality and we're using these very weird you know, data points and experiences and topics as a way of exploring our own relationship to that, but also looking at how do other people make sense of these phenomenon, right? And, and so there's three main components to the year-long program. One is the metadisciplinary kind of intellectual exploration. And there's 150 books that I'll be teaching from throughout the year. And that book list is on the website. Like, so I've read or will have read all of those and I'll be lecturing from those, right? So in a way, it's kind of a summary of 150 of some of the best books out there across all these categories that we've been talking about. The other component is a really safe place for people to share their own anomalous and paranormal experiences, their own UFO sightings, their own encounters with non-human intelligences. The more and more time I spend in this field, the more I discover that people, lots of people are having their own experiences and they often don't have a place to share them because there's such a taboo around this. So one of the really beautiful, powerful parts of the program is people being able to share and witness other people's bizarre experiences and do it in a safe place where they can kind of integrate those experiences by getting feedback and sharing. The third component is a more somatic um, experiential component, which is exploring this phenomena through different practices, through group um, work intentions. Um, and, and so it combines kind of an intellectual approach, the metadisciplinary with a heartfelt safe place to share experiences. And then also kind of an experiential body-based somatic or Gnostic approach to engaging with this phenomenon in an experiential way. So I think that's what makes this program unique is because it kind of combines the head, the heart and, and the body um, in a unique way, exploring the core mystery and nature of reality. Hmm. Sounds interesting. So go check this out, the website exostudies.org, right? And uh, okay, and thank you very much, Sean, for, this, for these insights. And thank you very much for being on the show. Great. Thank you, Robert. Great to be here. And thank you very much for watching this. Go check out his website, exostudies.org. Quite interesting stuff there. Thanks. Bye.